as the measurements are very critical. You can see my slides well. I think you can, yeah? Okay. Yeah. I think, yeah. Uh, uh, great, great. Just need a bit of confirmations. Right. When it comes to aortic stenosis, I think we all know that uh, degenerative tricuspid aortic valve disease is actually the most common cause of what we see today. However, when it comes to um, the type of aortic stenosis, it's important to ascertain whether this is tricuspid as well as whether rheumatic aortic stenosis is the other topic that I was given. So I will just take my time to go through this together with the rest of you. When it comes to the bicuspid aortic valve, we will hear later, the second speaker will talk a bit more about it, is to identify what is the pathology of bicuspid, whether it is no rafe with complete, it's just two casts, or the typical ones that we see more commonly, which is type 1 bicuspid with one rafe, and usually 80% of that is a fusion of right and left cast. This is important because it has implications for transcatheter valve therapy, especially in the area of um, TAVI. Now, I was given a talk about cardiac imaging for uh, rheumatic as well as tricuspid aortic stenosis that is of degenerative. I think the important thing about degenerative aortic stenosis is that, that it doesn't involve the commissions. When it comes to the typical degenerative aortic stenosis, usually there's no commissional fusions and the free edge of the cast are not involved. And you see a very nice star-shaped orifice uh, that is reduced because of aortic stenosis from classifications or degenerations. This is in contrast to the uh, rheumatic aortic stenosis where you see usually a commissural fusion. And in this case, you can see a fusion of the right as well as non coronary cast. And typically you have thickening and there could be also classifications. And typically you see rheumatic mitral stenosis as well because that's more frequently uh, involved in rheumatic mitral um, disease. I think when it comes to evaluation of aortic stenosis, all of us depend very much on echocardiography, and we look at three parameters, and the most important parameters is that of VMAX, and then followed by mean gradient and aortic valve area. In this part of the world where the uh, body surface area could be small, of course, a small habitus is important for us to index to the body surface area such that in severe aortic stenosis after defining or um, indexing to the body surface area is that of less than 0.6. And in ACC guidelines, it's important in our echo report to include that of a very severe aortic stenosis that includes a VMAX of more than 5 or mean gradient of more than 60 because it has got prognostic implications. Now, the, the, the problem with us sometimes in the echocardiography lab is that we need to really ascertain the highest velocity. Otherwise, we are going to underestimate the severity of aortic stenosis. And this is done typically by multi-windows um, uh, interrogations of the jet. It is important to ensure that you get the highest velocity, and that could be not necessary from the apical window. Any deviations of more than 15 degrees could actually underestimate the velocity, thereby underestimating the severity. In this case, as you can see, in the apical window, we have a VMAX of 3, but in the right sternal edge, when we do a careful interrogations, we view a velocity of more than 4 meters per second, telling us that it's a severe aortic stenosis. At the same time, if you look at the CW of the um, uh, Doppler signal, if you have a rounded shape, it tells you more severe than someone who has typical early peak of triangular shaped Doppler. So it gives us a sense of the severity when you make into comparison between the two. It's important as well that when we assess aortic stenosis, we do not take uh, patients with sub-aortic obstructions such as that of Holcomb as a severe aortic stenosis because this is not true. So it's a just looking at a CW Doppler is, is easier for us to determine if this is sub aortic uh, hokum kind of uh, uh, problem or that of severe AS. The other parameters we looked at is the mean gradient. Mean gradient is important because it has uh, prognosis implications. And in fact, it's the averaging of instance air gradients over the ejection period. So mean gradient measurements actually comes from the same measurement on echo and CW Doppler getting the highest velocity and thereby getting the maximum CW Doppler. Usually, we do not need to correct for the uh, proximal flow velocity unless the proximal flow velocity is high. For instance, in patients with high output failure or significant aortic regurgitation or sub-aortic um, uh, LVOT obstructions, in that cases, you probably have to correct for that. Otherwise, you will overestimate the severity of true valvular aortic stenosis. The other errors that we do is that of the uh, mistaking the MRJ for aortic stenosis. So it's important that you looked at the 
the, the, the envelope and that you only looked and uh, signed aortic stenosis at the ejection phase of the valve. Do not take mitral regurgitations because that could overestimate the true severity of aortic stenosis too. And then the last parameters we looked at in any report in echocardiography is that of aortic valve area. And remember, for aortic valve area calculations, is through the continuity equation taking into three parameters here, which is LVOT diameter, LVOT ETI, as well as aortic valve ETI. So underestimations of LVOT diameter actually is the commonest mistake, and this underestimated true flow state of the outflow track. So we do that very methodically in our lab. We have to ensure that you get the maximum um, LVOT diameter, which is measured from the inner edge, the inner edge of the septal endocardium to the anterior mitral valve leaflet. And usually in the patients with very severe dense LV LVOT classification, we may have to do a bit of altered view or off-axis view to, uh, to yield the highest or the largest LVOT diameter. And this should be done during system. And at the same time, if you do this correctly, uh, any um, LVOT diameter that is within one centimeter of the aortic valve and it just tends to actually give you the same uh, measurements as long as you open up the LVOT very well. The next parameters that's important when we calculate the continuity equation is that of LVOT DTI. It's important when we do sample uh, volume placement of house Doppler is to avoid the flow accelerations once you actually calculate wrongly because of the overestimations of flow and that will not be good for uh, assessing the aortic stenosis. And the best measurements is just distal to the valve and the maximum laminar flow, and this will be the LVOT VTI that we plug into the continuity equations. I think it's very important to highlight that it's an effective orifice area based on the continuity equation that is the predictor of clinical outcome. In fact, the anatomy area may not be the best. I would like to summarize by saying that when it comes to aortic valve cal area calculations using the continuity equations, a lot of the errors actually come from LVOT diameter. We should do it correctly, opening up as much as possible the perpendicular to the axis of the LVOT and the AS, uh, aortic valve. The other measurements that we tend to also get is that we have to do multi uh, window interrogation so as to avoid the uh, underestimation because of the alignment of the jet. In our lab, usually we will assess um, in our report that um, to, to, to yield the highest velocity from either the apical or uh, um, uh, sub, uh, substernal uh, window, such that we know the next time when we measure it, we should follow and get the highest velocity from there. And also the LVOT diameter is also in our report because it usually do not change over time. Sometimes Optimizing the, uh, the windows may be really difficult. We take a ratio of the dimensionless index. In this case, we take anything that's less than 0.25 or 25%, tells you that's the most significant of, uh, severity of the aortic stenosis. So I think it's a nice measure if you really cannot align the check, apart from doing an invasive uh, externalization. Telemetry also tells you a bit more about the anatomy of the valve, so it tends to tell you if the aortic stenosis is severe, and it is also a nice number of uh, methods to assess the aortic stenosis if you can't really get the highest code. I think the um, recommendations from the guidelines is really an optimization of LVOT assessments and DTI. The next thing that really is another conundrum when we manage patients is that of low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis with reduce EF or preserve EF. I think we, I will speak a bit more about that because it's important for diagnosis of severe aortic uh, AS in this group. By definition, what does low flow, low gradient AS mean? It means that when you have a discordant in terms of calculated aortic valve area of less than one centimeter square, and however, the mean gradient is less than 40. And this would happen because of the low flow state, because of reduced LV systolic function, or because the LV cavity is too uh, thick that the flow is actually reduced. The question then is, is AS severe that you want to render for patients to subject to an aortic valve intervention. So in this case, for example, you have a patient with severe LV systolic dysfunctions, and then the question you have for yourself is, is this true severe aortic stenosis because of afterload dispatch with LV dysfunctions that you want to offer aortic valve intervention, or is it an LV dysfunction in concomitant non-severe aortic stenosis? So these two you need to tease out because you want to offer surgery or an aortic valve intervention such as uh, Terry. 
In this case, you have case one, the patient with very severe uh, LV dysfunction after calculations of the aortic bark area, even by index is severe. However, the mean gradient is less than 40 and the VMAX is three and not less, not more than four. The second case is that of bicuspid aortic stenosis. And in this, you have patients with, again, LV dysfunctions and the calculated aortic bark area is 0.8 and even index is less than 0.6, so it's severe by definition, yet the gradient is only 32. So what would you do? As I said before, it's important to ensure that all measurements are done properly. In this case, um, getting the highest velocity, it may be from the right center edge or super left center edge, and that it already gives you a severe aortic stenosis by definition, then there's no need to go for further measurement. Otherwise, a low flow, low dose, uh, a low dose to vitamin strength will be the next thing to do. The whole purpose of increasing the dobutamine is to increase the forward flow. To increase the forward flow, you hope that the velocity will be higher and if it's severe aortic stenosis, the jet will not will be higher than 4 meters per second or be greater than more than 40. However, the aortic bar figure do not exceed 1. So in that case, it will choose severe stenosis. However, sometimes because of LV dysfunctions or where there's no contractor or flow reserve, you can't tell either whether it's too severe or just concomitant uh, uh, non-severe aortic stenosis. In that case, the flow uh, measurements from dobutamine stress do not help you. So we go to the next measurements, such as that of calcifications of aortic bar. If the calcium is very um, calcified in this case that is seen here on the right panel, then you know that this is very severe aortic stenosis. Now, by definitions, a woman with anything less than uh, 100, 1,002 on calcium score of the aortic valve of men, less than 2,000 is not severe, but above this is considered severe. So we go back to our case number one, we've given the low flow to be stress, and we are able to increase the flow to more than 20%, that will be enough of what we call flow reserve. However, the mean gradient do not go beyond 40, and the VMAX is only three, and we are able to open the valve above, just above one. So these patients, we actually waited for a while, and to confirm that the aortic stenosis is not yet severe, we actually did a calcium score, and indeed it is just a female, she do not have true severe aortic stenosis at stage. We watch her very carefully, actually six to nine months later, she becomes symptomatic, and she actually went on to go for an aortic valve uh, intervention for TAMI. The second case, the bicuspid aortic valve, which you probably remember, in this case, we actually increased the dobutamine to 20, and by then we have managed to increase the stroke volume above 50, and then we have also derived a velocity above five, uh, four, and um, a gradient above 50. So she, he has a severe aortic stenosis, and then she was given heptabi, and she actually recovered very well with almost uh, normalization of the LV dysfunctions. The next possibility is that of a paradoxical low flow growth gradient AS with preserved or normal ER. This can happen because, as I said before, because of uh, hypertrophy of the LV and small LV, LV cavity. However, in this case, not only you have to assure that the, the, the measurements are correct, usually we look for other possible causes, such as if there is a significant mitral regurgitation or tricuspid regurgitation or stenosis, the forward flow across the aortic valve is reduced, and that could explain the reduced in stroke volume. So in, in again, paradoxical low, low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis is actually one of the hardest for us in the lab to ascertain whether it's severe. Sometimes even increasing or doing dobutamine stress may not help because of such a small LV cavity augmentation of flow will happen despite uh, dobutamine. So what we do is we actually can do calcium score again and using the same cutoff, we can identify whether this is severe or less severe aortic stenosis. Sometimes the guidelines actually recommend that we have to verify the flow across the valve by looking whether is the stroke volume really reduced. So we do other multi-metric um, approach of looking at the uh, stroke volume using either 3D echoes or a CMR to ascertain that this is truly a low flow state because of low volume. I think I just want to summarize before I go to aortic regurgitation that in aortic valve classifications, it's very helpful, especially in a patient with low flow, classical, low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis with reduced EF, where you don't see a flow reserve, you can't tell after the vitamin stress, or in patient with preserved LV dysfunction, uh, with preserved LV function, sometimes you just can't tell that a calcium score can help. This is a case of a rheumatic aortic stenosis, where you see a rheumatic mitral stenosis 
And then in this case, you can see that the mean gradient is 40 and the VBAX is a, a four and severe cirrhosis is both confirmed with hemodynamics as well as the valve area. However, if you do a calcium score on her, you actually do not have very high calcium score, telling us that the aortic valve calcification score assessments of aortic stenosis is only applicable for calcific aortic stenosis and not so for either inflammatory or rheumatic fibrotic aortic stenosis. With that, I would like to just spend the next five minutes on the assessments of aortic regurgitation. I think Dr. B will talk more about it. Suffice to say, when we assess aortic regurgitation, we have a look at the etiology as well as the uh, reasons for the mechanism of aortic regurgitations. The next thing that we normally do for aortic regurgitation assessment is that of Doppler. And I would like to just highlight the importance of looking at the flow conversions where you look at the venal conjectile brief. Because renal contactor in aortic news, uh, aortic regurgitation is very helpful. It is the, probably the more reliable parameters that I depend on because it's independent of the flow state as well as, well as the driving force. So it's useful to measure that to give us a set of assessments of whether the aortic regurgitation is severe. And of course, if you have multi parameters to suggest it's severe, then it's quite consistent. However, sometimes you may have in between and you're not sure whether you're dealing with aortic. Regurgitation. And that's the important role of doing a TE in AR assessment. In TE, we can assess the aortic regurgitations more clearly. And especially as in patients with acute AR, sometimes the flow in the, the regurgitation can be very acute due to equalization or rapid equalization of the pressures that the flow is not present anymore. But if you do a, a TE on them, you can see that the aortic regurgitation is very severe. Not only that, you can assess the morphology of the aortic valve. For example, in the right panel, the aortic regurgitation is not probably just moderate, but it is a morphology of that of four units of uh, aortic valve. It's quite rare. Without that, we are not sure what we're dealing with, uh, and yet the aortic regurgitation uh, is not uh, present, so we couldn't explain why the central regurgitation. The next thing is, um, of course, um, planning for any surgery such as valve repair is important to, to look at the anatomy of aortic valve. For example, in this case, this is an infective endocarditis with masses that has destroyed the non coronary cusp. In this case, you can see perforations. Lastly, I think we should not um, forget that there are other cardiac imaging such as CMR that allows much more actual assessments of the aortic regurgitation. In this case, both the aortic valve as well as the root anatomy as well as the aortic regurgitation quantification and severity because CMR allows you to do phase contrast velocity coding kind of mapping to allow for um, the measurements of forward and the uh, backward or the leakage. And that tells you the regurgitation fractions. We can indicate the severity of uh, aortic regurgitation. It's also helpful to look at the LV dimensions of the um, patients with chronic aortic regurgitations as well as the, the, the status of an aortic uh, root anatomy. So in my mind, I have to ask myself, when do I refer to CMR for AR assessment? I usually do that when I have suboptimal uh, echo windows on the patient with severe, uh, or I suspect severe aortic regurgitation and with multiple aortic regurgitation jet or eccentric AR that I know I'm going to get under estimations from aortic uh, regurgitation from echo. And this kind of scenario or any discordance between clinical and echo findings, I'll refer them to um, CMR. I think with that, I thank you very much for your attention, and it's nice um, having to see all of you uh, in this webinar. Thanks very much for Dr. Yeo's uh, very informative and very clear uh, talk about the uh, several images in LT valve estimation. Uh, before any question from the audience, may I have the first question? Uh, I heard I heard you talk about the CMR to estimate the quanti quantification of LD regurgitation. Do you, in your experience, do you have a, a reference guideline a comparison between? Uh, CMR quantification for the degree of LD regurgitation and the 
and that uh, and that the measurement done by the echocardiography. Um, thank you very much, Professor Yi, for these questions. I think it's always an important uh, uh, clinical decision making whether who you yeah. should trust, right? So I have an experience uh, a few years ago looking at uh, aortic regurgitations and what sort of aortic regurgitations will correlate well with CMR and those who do not. So my experience is if you have central aortic regurgitations, the PISA quantifications as on echo seems to correlate quite well on CMR, which okay. means that you can trust um, your echo measurements, whether that is by quantitative methods on the PISA quantifications on echo, on 3D echo. The other possibility is that of eccentric aortic regurgitation that by PISA quantifications tend to underestimate based on the echo. Yeah. So I do not actually trust PISA quantifications on the eccentric jet. If you go on to do CMR, you think that you will underestimate because of the fact that in CMR, you actually can directly measure the flow before yeah. and leaking. And then I have the opportunity because I actually looked at 3D and whether 3D can help um, doing a venal contractile by 3D. And it seems that it can correlate a bit better, certainly better with respect to the central AR rather than eccentric AR. So either you move on to CMR for eccentric AR, or if you would like to, to do 3D. But 3D is not as easy for trans -thoracic. If you want to do 3D, you have to go to 3D trans -esophageal. I hope that Great. helps. And uh, in, 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 in the hospital I serve, I, I, I work in the National Taiwan University Hospital in Taipei, Taiwan. Uh, the regular clinical practice for the aortic valve regurgitation, once uh, studied by echocardiography, usually we do the CT and uh, very seldom we will do MRI. Uh, and, and may I ask uh, what's your opinion about the uh, echo CT MRI in clinical practice in your hospital? Thank you for the questions again. Now, for us, we don't do CT routinely for CMR assessment because CT actually looks more for the anatomy of the aortic valve and the roof. Um, to do quantifications on CT, especially the LV chamber size and the function, I think you have to deal with you know, a lot more of either contrast or radiations. So yes. we don't use it on a routine basis. We do that for aortic regurgitation on CT to look for complications of the infective endocarditis because that's much more clearer with uh, better spatial resolutions compared to, say, for example, um, CMR. So if you have to look at anatomy, sure, I go for CT. But if I look at hemodynamic of the uh, LV dilatations, as well as uh, CFR, AR assessment, then it will be unfortunately a CMR. So in a hospital such as mine, I come from a public hospital, we have to be careful what sort of modality and where you want to place your money on. It is really one modality that you think will decide on the management plan. So for yes. an asymptomatic aortic uh, regurgitation, I normally follow them up. If I can't get a good assessment on echo, I will do a CMR. And I may have to do every six do yearly CMR to look at the LV dilatations if echo is the limiting um, imaging to assess properly. But if I have to do that just because I wanted to plan for surgery, for example, aortic valve repair or aortic root repair, it will definitely be a CT because the CT gives me the answer quite straight away. And I, I think the pictures are excellent. And money-wise, it's a little bit cheaper. Yes, yes, yes. Uh because I'm a cardiac surgeon, many of my case is uh, referred for uh, possibility of uh, aortic root repair, you know, huh? uh, something like that. So we do a lot of CD. May I ask a question? How, uh, when, when regarding the aortic valve repair, mm, uh, what, what, what parameter will you measure by echocardiography, I mean annular diameter, the height of uh, commissure, the sinus, uh, sinus tubular junction, something like that. Do you have any comments? 
well um well asked questions in fact um i i think this is something that is actually um in my hospital that the surgeons are asking us and i i actually tell them you know you tell me what is important for you because um we, we have to cater to what you need so a commercial commercial kind of measurements and the yeah. cost length is something that they would like mm. us to measure i don't put it in my um um, um talk because i think that it's very very specialized and and only in the expert center um I, i think it really depends on what your you guys want and you work with the imaging colleague what is best Um, so I don't have uh, really very much experience in it. We have a few cases, but I think maybe the second talk or um, the second speaker could address some of these questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you again. My pleasure. For the, yeah, for the limit of time, I have to close this session. If uh, no more questions from my audience, uh, sorry to occupy too much of time. <laughs> okay. Uh, So let's move to the second speech. Uh, second speech is uh, bring, brought by Dr. Mahmoud Trena from UAE. Dr. Mahmoud Trena is a clinical professor of medicine in, clin in Cleveland Clinic. Also, uh, is now a director in cardiac cath lab and the Heart and Vascular Institute in Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi. Uh, Dr. Trina brings us a topic about assessment and the interventional management of a severe tricuspid valve and the bicuspid, tricuspid versus bicuspid LT valve stenosis, whether uh, both uh, either to done by Tavi saver or bento operation. Uh, please, Dr. Trainer. Thank you so much, Dr. Yu. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And I'm very happy to be joining you all today and hopefully I uh, can add something to this session. Um, so I'll be talking about the kind of how we evaluate and management of patients with aortic stenosis, both tricuspid and uh, bicuspid in terms of our decision-making of uh, transcatheter approaches versus surgical approaches. So I have no disclosures relevant to this talk. And as we all know, there's a huge burden of aortic stenosis um, with the vast majority of these patients being uh, low risk. But um, up until recently, and especially with the advent of TAVR, very low percentage of these patients were getting to surgery and to operation. This is just one series from uh, at the, around the time of the first partner trials shows that of, uh, in, across 10 centers, 950 patients with severe AS, only half were getting referred for surgery. And of those, only about 40% were getting uh, had surgery done. And this was seen across multiple series is uh, there's a huge uh, unmet need of patients with severe aortic stenosis out there for various reasons that aren't getting referred for intervention. Now, if we look at the, uh, where's the spectrum of, uh, of, the, of uh, evaluation for patients with, uh, with TAVR, the first trials, obviously, as we all know, were the partner trials that were done in 2000, that were presented in 2010 and 2011, starting with the partner 1B, which looked at patients that were inoperable and showed that TAVR had a significant 50% reduction in mortality compared to standard therapy, which is nothing um, at that time. Second part of TAB partner was a partner 1A trial, which was the high risk group, and again showed similar death with a trend towards reduced death with TAVR compared to surgery. Now, so this led to a in very increased use of TAVR in these populations, but one of the important things, and when we discuss again decision making, and we could have added a fourth group is uh, TAVR, SAVR, Bental, or, or, or nothing is. What, what point is their futility and what point does it become too late in, in terms of predicting outcomes? Now, frailty has been found to be a very powerful predictor of uh, mortality across uh, all the trials. This is an analysis from the partner two trial showed that just frailty independent when, when controlled for other factors, increased prediction of mortality. And frailty was a poor prediction of outcomes both in the TAVR and the SAVR, SAVR populations, as you can see on the, on the table here on the right. 
And so there's been multiple risk models, but as, as makes sense, if the patient goes in in a very poor status, they tend to come out in a poor status with, the, with both TAVR or surgery, whatever, whatever you treat the patient with, and it's not gonna fix uh, patients all, all their situations. So patients with poor functional status, poor quality of life, relatively low mean or valve gradients, lung disease and kidney disease are particularly high risk of post-procedure low quality of life. So how do we evaluate patients with uh, severe aortic stenosis? So obviously the first step is multimodality imaging. So the key cardinal features are echo, uh, CT and coronary angiography, kind of to get a true understanding of the anatomy and the disease process. Then we evaluate by a multidisciplinary team and fundamental to that evaluation is really obtaining true numbers. So a Euro score, STS score of the patient, anatomical factors, looking at their comorbidities. And through the multidisciplinary heart team, which involves the cardiologist, the surgeon, the imaging cardiologist, um, and the anesthesiologist make a decision about which, which way each patient can go versus surgical versus, or transcatheter approach. And if it is transcatheter, transfemoral, which is the ideal or need for alternative access. Now, as, as we're all aware and was mentioned previously in previous talk, when we assess these patients with aortic stenosis for therapy, therapies, cardiac CT has really become the uh, cardinal feature after echo in terms of assessing. So we can be able to assess the annular dimension on the CT. We can assess coronary height, the calcification, um, we actually can get a better assessment of whether it's bicuspid or tricuspid. It's often missed on, uh, on echo where you can't really tell where, with the calcification, you get a true exact delineation of that. And we get a very good delineation of the uh, iliofemoral anatomy, so that, that, uh, which is essential for evaluation of patients for potential tablet. Now, when we're talking about these high-risk patients, it's really important to have a true framework for TAVR assessment. So, so, you know, when we look at the heart team, we have to look at what is, we have to analyze what are the potential anticipated benefits for the patient? What's their underlying clinical risk? What's their geriatric risk from, from, their, from their other comorbidities and frailty in general? And the patient's goals and preferences. And I think, you know, there's a scope of patients where when the benefit is high and the risk is relatively low, where we want to target uh, TAVR, but at some point, the benefit to the patients in the severely frail and severe uh, comorbidity patients where the discussion often has to, uh, has to be done about, are we, are we pursuing a, a futile course? And I think that's very important in, in when we talk about these very high risk uh, or advanced cases. So following the high risk patient uh, trials came the intermediate risk trials. And that was uh, with Tavra was then the partner two trials. And um, in that was, uh, if we looked at the overall intention to treat population, showed a similar outcomes in surgery versus TAVR using the Sapien XT valve when we we're looking at hard endpoints, death from any cause or disabling stroke. But if you look just specifically at the transfemoral cohort, which was a pre-specified cohort, actually TAVR showed superiority to surgery in that group. So I think this is the trial that really showed us that femoral access TAVR is the optimal approach and any, any, other, uh, any other approaches would be a transapical, which is probably the worst approach versus transaortic or, or subclavian or even transcarotid are uh, secondary approaches when, when transform femoral is not available. So during this time also, there was a significant, there's been a lot of development in terms of the uh, device uh, uh, ability with, with the, these delivery of these devices. So We've been able to go from 22 French in the initial Sapien valves down to 16 French with the XT and down to uh, 14 French with the Sapien 3 valves. So smaller delivery systems, purely percutaneous, improved procedural techniques and access techniques to improve uh, 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 bleeding complications and other procedural complications. And so a, lot, and a, a much wider range of valves allow treatment of a lot more, uh, more patients. This is a registry trial, so it's a little bit, you know, um, have to hard to kind of look at, but this is took patients treated with a Sapien 3, so the, the third generation Sapien valve, and uh, had a case match controls to the partner two trials. 
and we show that in, in this in this registry comparison uh, case control study showed that TAVR had improved mortality compared to surgery along with a reduced stroke rate. And we see that across the board with the, with the trials as technique has improved and as technology has improved and uh, worldwide experience has improved, mortality with TAVR has decreased from as high as 6% in the early partner trials down to the one to 2% range with current CPN3 registries. Similarly, stroke rates as, as again, technique and, and, uh, and procedural uh, uh, devices have improved, have also decreased from where it was a particular concern in the first partner trials of over five to 6% down to one to 2% with current generation sapien valves. We also see similar with the self-expanding valves in the, in, the, in the SIRTAVI trial for the intermediate risk patients showed, again, similar outcomes um, for uh, death or stroke rate with uh, TAVR as compared to surgery. With a caveat that with, the, with, this, with this issue, we, did we do have higher rates of vascular complications with uh, percutaneous approaches and particularly concerning with, uh, with the earlier generations of, of, uh, of uh, self-expanding valves is a high permanent pacemaker rates, 25% as reported in the SIRTAVI trial. Now, one of the important issues that come up with, uh, with TAVR approaches is perivalvular leaks. So uh, this is kind of from the uh, uh, partner trials looking at the presence of perivalvular leak and prediction of outcomes. And it's not that, um, it's not a benign finding. So perivalvular leak is a very uh, malignant process. And even the presence of mild perivalvular leak conferred a almost 50% increased mortality uh, versus none or trace, and moderate to severe perivalvular leak more than doubled mortality in patients. So this is an important issue when planning and deciding in uh, TAVR, and especially as we start talking about lower risk patients, is the, the, to avoid that perivalvular leak. Now, as the te technology has improved with the self-expanding valves from the initial core valve to Evolute R followed by Evolute Pro, the rates of perivalvular leak have also dramatically declined where only a quarter of patients have mild leak and very rare to have moderate or severe leak in, in, um, in this study. Similarly, again, we, we see the same thing with the, with the sapien valves is that the rates of perivalvular leak in the partner trials um, um, has dramatically decreased from where we were having rates of moderate to severe perivalvular leak of 11 and 12% in the uh, partner 1A and 1B trial to, to 1% to 3% in more recent um, iterations of the data. An important concern as we again try to consider uh, patients with lower risk is the durability of the valves. So are these valves as durable as surgical valves with tavern valves? And at least to date with the data we have from the uh, partner trials shows that uh, the valves are very durable out to five, at least to five years and more recent data out to eight to 10 years, approaching those uh, or, or equal to those of surgical valves in terms of gradients and in terms of uh, failure rates. So when we start discussing TAVR potentially in lower risk patients, what, what, what are the outcomes that we need to meet? We need to be able to meet, achieve very low risk data as, uh, as surgeons have been able to achieve with these low risk patients over the years. So benchmark of mortality of 1%, stroke rates of, one, of around 1%, lower the vascular complications below 5%, avoid permanent pacemakers and have it less than 10%, and dramatically reduce moderate to severe AI. Now, these are the outcomes of the two largest uh, low-risk trials. So the Partner 3 trial was, a, was with a, a balloon expandable sapien valve and showed a Reduction this time, you know, with the data included rehospitalization. So death stroke or rehospitalization showed a significant reduction with TAVR, primarily driven by the rehospitalization outcome. In the Evolute low risk trial, again, looking at just hard endpoints, death or disabling stroke, there was a trend towards reduction in events with TAVR valves. And if we look at a meta analysis of the low risk trials, so which include the SIRTAVI, the Partner 3, and uh, Notion and Evolute low risk the overall meta-analysis favors TAVR in reducing mortality. So lower mortality with uh, TAVR as compared to surgical ABR. This is all-cause death, reduced cardiovascular death, 
and trends towards reduction in stroke and MI. Now it's important caveat. So this is mean that we send all patients with aortic stenosis for TAVR. And I think this is um, often missed is what are the exclusion criteria and what was excluded from these trials? So across the board, bicuspid valves were excluded from these trials. Iliofemoral disease, significant iliofemoral disease that prevented transfemoral access were excluded from these trials. Complex coronary uh, artery disease were excluded from these trials. So I think it's very important to understand which patients were included. And, these, and the mean age of these patients, even in the low risk trials was 72. And so younger patients were primarily either excluded uh, with a cutoff age of 65 in the uh, partner three and the uh, uh, Sertavi trial or were uh, rare in these trials. And when we start targeting these therapies in, in younger patients, that's important to recognize. Now, what are some examples of high risk anatomical features? So low coronary height, for example, as you can see in A and D, uh, is, is an important issue with TAVR that leading to possible coronary obstruction. Bicuspid valves with calcified raphe and heavily excess leaflet calcifications, a high risk an anatomy. Um, as we look on the uh, C and F pictures there, presence of severe LVOT calcium. So when that's a, a risk for a rupture and, uh, and uh, complications with with TAVR valves are important to evaluate. So when we're making these decisions on these patients, um, we can make a blanket, uh, blank, blanket approach to all the patients. So I'd like to spend a little bit more time um, in these next few minutes just talking about bicuspid aortic valve. And like I mentioned, bicuspid valves were excluded from all the pivotal low-risk randomized trials and even the intermediate and high-risk trials, they were excluded. Um, and there's certain features about bicuspid valve that make it uh, more challenging. So the annulus tends to be more elliptical. The distribution of calcium is asymmetric. Um, they often have bulkier calcification and extending into the LVOT. They tend to have lower coronary heights. And uh, of course, the presence of ascending aortic dilation, which may need to be managed surgically. So when we look at bicuspid aortic valve, the classic uh, description is in the Sievers classification, where we Type the group them into type zero, type one, and type two. Type zero having uh, no RAFE um, uh, to bicuspid valve, it's about 7% of patients. Type one, which is the majority, where we have a, we do have a single RAFE. And then type two is where we have two RAFEs. So TAVR has been done, though it's not in a uh, randomized trial. There is a registry of bicuspid aortic uh, stenosis that have been done by TAVR. Um, and when we look at the simple on the right, all cause mortality is similar. Again, these are pre-selected patients. So people, they're evaluated and, uh, and decided for TAVR. So it can be achieved with reasonable mortality that approaches what we see with tricuspid AS. But if we look at the table on the left, the uh, rates of complications are higher. So the conversion rate to surgery is higher. The rates of aortic injury, root injury is higher. The need um, for a second valve is higher and the, and the rates of paravalvular leak are higher. So longer term outcomes um, may, may be worse in these patients and we need to really evaluate um, which patients will be considered for TAVR. Now, some of this was driven by earlier generation devices. So if we look at the earl earliest generation devices, the rates were higher for paravalvular leak and device failure and need for pacemaker as newer generation devices have come out with the Sapien 3 and the Evolute Pro, and technique has improved, higher implantation um, has become a standard, I think mostly worldwide um, with, with, all the, with all the valves have led to lower rates of pacemakers and lower rates of paravalvular leak. So there's a lot of variability in, in, uh, in bicuspid anatomy. And I think, uh, you know, there's, you know, when we can get into it, it becomes a lot of descriptions. So not all type zeros are the same, not all type ones are the same. And, there, and there's, a, becomes a little bit complicated in describing them. But I think uh, I like this, um, this table from Yoon and Makar, and I think it kind of provides a, at least from a um, management issue, a more simplified way of looking at these patients when we look at bicuspid valves in a phenotype, so a clinical phenotype. So where we look at first, do they have a RAFE? Is the RAFE, and then is the RAFE calcified? And second, how, 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 what's their degree of leaflet calcification? Is it mild or is it excessive? And this is kind of can group patients into 
key clinical factors, which I'll show you, makes a difference in terms of decision making. So those that have mild lethal calcifications can be considered. Those that have excess lethal calcification, especially when combined for a calcified RAFE, uh, are the patients that do poorly with uh, TAVR. And this is kind of uh, shown in their, in their registry, in the same registry of 1,115 patients. If they just have one of those two features, so either just a calcified RAFE or excess lethal calcifications, they approach um, the outcomes of those that don't. But if you have the combination of those two features, those really do the worst uh, long-term with, with TAVR. And uh, they have higher rates of perivalvular leak, more in aortic root injury, and those are the ones that have the higher rates, higher mortality overall. So just to give you an example, this is kind of how we look at it in, in our heart team approach um, and we prepare for all our TAVR patients is we kind of create this uh, chart where we kind of summarize all the key fundamental features. We look at the patient's um, history, their STS score, their laboratory findings, their uh, echo and CT findings and cath findings and kind of uh, discuss them in a, a multidisciplinary manner about optimal approaches. So this is an example of a case we did with a 72, a 74-year-old uh, with comor multiple comorbidities and frail with a SES score in the intermediate range of 5%, um, not a good surgical candidate, had uh, severe aortic stenosis, but on the anatomy had a low coronary height, and which was, a, which was an issue along with a small valve that we decided based on her surgical risk to go ahead with TAVR. So this is, again, I, if I had to put one point of emphasis in the decision-making of these is our team is critical in making any of these decisions. So what are the factors when we look at, there's multiple factors that look at coronary obstruction risk and how we decide the, the length of the leaflets, where's the calcium located, is it, is it, where's the coronary osteum and how big are the, is the sinus? These are all, all helpful features that kind of evaluating the patients, but often, when the decision is made, the proof is in the, in, the, in the pudding. So this is that patient with, again, very severe advanced aortic stenosis, um, high gradient, mean gradient over 60. And when we look at the anatomy, again, you can see here on the left, there's a very low coronary height, which is concerning um, and, uh, and an issue, but the sinuses are relatively large. We do a, Pre-dilation in these cases, we do a balloon to try to see if the leaflet, if we have deflect the leaflet up, uh, does it affect the coronary? And we can still see over there on the left that the left coronary is filling, but it's a pretty small channel. So in a case like this, this is a case where we decided to pre-prep pre, uh, for a potential obstruction in the case and place a stent into the coronary um, to have it ready in case there's a coronary obstruction, which is in, would be an immediate um, and emergent situation. So there's an Edward Sapien valve placed. We positioned it a little bit lower than we normally would. Um, we tend to be at about a 90-10 position on most of these cases. This one we placed a little bit lower, again, given the coronary, coronary location. Deploy the valve afterwards tolerated it well and, uh, and was able to keep the coronary state open and did not luckily need to deploy the stand in this case. Had good hemodynamic response and did well. So this is again, but a high gradient because I had to use a small 20 millimeter valve. So in summary, um, I think the key with all these decision makings in terms of uh, TAVR versus SAVR is a, is a well-functioning multidisciplinary heart team is really the most essential aspect for optimal decision-making for each individual patient. Uh, high quality multimodality imaging with echo, CT, and coronary uh, angiography are essential to guide the treatment decisions. In general, increased surgical risk and comorbidities as reflected increased uh, STS and Euroscores or frailty tend to favor TAVR. The presence of higher risk in, uh, anatomy, severe ephemeral disease, low coronary, high LVT calcium, the presence of dilated ascending orders, especially in the setting of, uh, of bicuspid valves, generally favor surgical uh, aortic valve disease. And these were excluded from the pivotal trials. I think that's important to, to recognize. Bicuspid aortic stenosis was excluded from the pivotal trials. And I think younger, lower risk patients really should be considered for SAVR first line 
um, given that they, they may uh, need multiple interventions in the future. Um, and TAVR can be, but TAVR can be performed safely if there's higher surgical risk or there's no, no evidence of any high risk in that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. China. Oh. Great speech, very extensive and detailed explanation and very detailed review of uh, TAVR. Uh, as a cardiac surgeon, may I ask a, a question? Uh, I know all the TAVR is, uh, decision is made by a, a heart team, but uh, as you know, um, in many different regions, the leader of a heart team might be a surgeon or a cardiologist. Uh, uh, do you think, uh, it, will there be any, uh, some difference if the leader is a cardiac surgeon or a cardiologist uh, that any preference for surgical AVR tower? Yeah, no, I think that's, uh, that's uh, very important. You know, uh, these, a lot of these factors enter into this is, is who leads the team, um, and the financial incentive. So if people are on, um, if people are financially incentivized also affects how, uh, unfortunately, how the, how the decisions get made. But I think, um, you know, I, th I think at least like, for instance, in our center, the surgeons are a key part of the team. So the surgeons are there for the TAVR and the surgeon and, uh, um, and uh, they're part of the TAVR team. And so, so I think developing it as a group uh, initiative where they're where it's done together takes away, I think some of the uh, some of the, the the issues of the territorial nature of of those decision making. And I think hopefully we, you know, there's obviously a lot of factors into this decision making. Cost is a f fundamental issue in a lot of the world. And so whereas you know, um, tavern, you know, the cost of a tavern is going to be much more ex expensive. And so so there may be cost limitations in a lot of centers. But I think using that kind of combined, if we have the resources to make that best decision as a group is, is, is really the way to go. You know, Cleveland Clinic is a generally a very surgically driven uh, field, but I think the data is very clear and the surgeons are with us, for instance, here. So I would say for, like for us, we're at about a 70 to 75 percent TAVR versus 30 percent uh, surgical uh, AVR and uh, in terms of our approach and treatment of these patients. 70% TAVR and 30% uh, surgical AVR. Roughly, roughly, yes. Wow. <laughs> oh, okay. And, 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 and my next question is from the partner one, two, three trial, as you know, uh, more and more, more and more TAVR was done in the intermediate and low risk patients. So we do have the opportunity to follow up uh, not only in one or two years follow up, and we have the opportunity to see what's the outcome of valve. I mean, the valve outcome in about more than five years. Do you have any data in 10 years follow up? Why I ask this question? Because you know, uh, many of current surgeons, including me, will consider a durability of a good valve must last for, for example, 10 to 15 years. Yeah. As you, uh, do you have any data that yeah, that's, beyond 10 that, years? We, we, we don't, because as you know, the part, first partner trial was presented in 2010. So we're talking about, you know, and, and those were all high and non-operable patients. So very few of those people are still around to have long-term data on. I think yeah. we're starting to get, so there's been recently some eight-year data presented and showing reasonable results. So, but uh, but but any large scale outcomes to at this point to say that you know we are going to definitively these valves don't fail at ten to fifteen years. We don't have it uh, categorically proven. And I think as we enter into lower risk patients and we talk about these low risk patients, um, you know that's that's an important issue. Another issue becomes is. When you talk about low risk patients, as you're mentioning, and you're talking about a 60 year old patient, they're going to live to 90. You're talking yeah. about possibly two more interventions. And so the issue with TAVR is you put in a TAVR and then you're putting a valve and a valve and a valve and another valve. And I think in those younger patients, um, 
um, I think surgery is also going to be the even even with the as things get go along and cost get, goes down, I think those are still going to be a group of patients where surgery is going to be a better choice, at least up front, potentially followed by a TAVR down the line. Yeah. Oh. Uh, any comments about, you, you know, uh, a kind of surgical self-expandable valve uh, done through autotomy, such as Perseva, Intuity, something like that? Yes, I think I think those are those are really nice because they also give a great hemodynamics and can kind of yes. mimic uh, mimic surgical outcomes and and, and uh, very similar to like their self expanding valves in terms of the outcome. So our surgeons like to use the uh, quite a bit of the Percival valves, especially on the, some of these patients that uh, that they're that uh, that uh, are high risk or that yeah. have coronary disease or other reasons for surgery. I think uh, I think. I think uh, one of the th one of the things I think as a general is we've learned more about surgery since these trials than we probably knew because now we're collecting this data and we mm. we're, we're there's a lot more focus on on what's the optimal surgical approaches you know mini mini AVR I think has has dramatically increased worldwide um, mm -hmm. with the advent of this push of TAVR and minimally invasive approaches so so I think surgery is also significantly improved than what can be offered for patients um, um, along with the as as the technology for tavern and the like have also improved yeah i personal uh, i personally have a very little chance to perform tavern as you know <laughs> many of the tavern was done by our cardiologists so i personally very like to to use the self-expandable valve intuitive per se, but because mainly because the good hemodynamic and the morphology immediately after the operation, I can do it from uh, a uh, minimal invasive approach. Okay, patient feel also satisfied. Okay, any comments from audience? Um, if no other comments, uh, thanks again for Dr. Trina. Hey, very so excellent much. speech. And now we'll move on the sec the, the following presentation. And and uh, the following two presentations will host by Dr. Yu. Please. Thank you very much, Professor Yu. And then it's my great pleasure to actually present you the third speaker of today's webinar. It will be uh, by Dr. Masanuri um, Yamamoto, who is from Japan. And uh, he is going to give us a talk on decision-making in best management of aortic box stenosis in heart failure with reduced EF. And I think this is really important and uh, we would like to hear from him. Uh, Dr. Yamamoto, please. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so it is such a privilege to have an opportunity to present here. Thank you very much. So, uh, first of all, the, this slide shows a flow chart for aortic stenosis with heart failure uh, reduced ejection fraction treatment. And everybody knows uh, current uh, or classical severe aortic stenosis, it means, uh, for example, the mean pressure gradient more than 40. And uh, this Category is uh, aortic stenosis and uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. But we need to the uh, etiology and uh, severity of the aortic stenosis to, to define the severity of aortic stenosis, for example, by using the dobutamine stress echo. And uh, to determine uh, after the diagnosis of the severity of aortic stenosis, uh, for some patients, uh, diagnosis as true aortic stenosis or uh, pure moderate aortic stenosis. And as the chairman also presented the utility of the vitamin stress echocardiography, the panel A patient in panel A shows that after the dobutamine stress echo, the mean pressure gradient is increased from 29 to 52. So this patient is clearly diagnosed as severe aortic stenosis. In contrast, the panel B patient, uh, after the dobutamine stress echo, but the mean pressure gradient is still below 40. So 
the, this patient is uh, diagnosed as severe AS, but in contrast, the pa patient B is diagnosed as a sugar AS. This flowchart clearly reveals the uh, uh, feasibility of dopamine stress echo and flowchart. After the dopamine stress echo, the uh, stroke volume uh, increases more than 20%. It means a contractile reverse positive. And if the patient echocardiogram shows the mean pressure gradient more than 40, it's clearly diagnosed as true severe aortic stenosis. In contrast, the mean pressure gradient is less than 40. This patient is categorized as a pseudo AES. So if the patient diagnosed as true AES, uh, invasive treatment is generally recommended by using, for example, the surgical AVR or TAVI, TAVR. And if the patient is not severe AES, the medical therapy is recommended. Also, the, if the, after the dopamine stress echo, the stroke volume is less than 20, it means the contractile reverse is negative. We need the, uh, uh, another imaging modality evaluation, for example, by using the MDCT. And if the calcium score, is, uh, the volume of the calcium is abundant, it, the patient is also diagnosed as true severe aortic stenosis. It means a uh, uh, recommendation or a uh, uh, good indication of invasive therapy, both surgical AVR and TAVI. But it's not so abundant, uh, the patient has not so abundant calcium, the patient is diagnosed as she should severe aortic stenosis and the indication of the medical therapy. So, and the stroke volume is also important in Asian cohort. And uh, this slide shows the uh, Japanese Marriage Center Ocean Tabi Registry, the risk factor for predicting the cardiovascular mortality after TAVA. And multivariate analysis revealed the stroke volume index is significantly associated with the increased risk of the uh, cardiovascular mortality. And we Asian population is very small body characteristics. So the definition of the stroke volume and low flow less than 35 is adapted for small Asian cohort. In this registry data revealed the low flow evaluated less than 35 milliliter is associated with increased risk of mortality in Japanese. Also, it's also adapted in Asian cohort. So stroke volume index as 35 is a good threshold for evaluating, for predicting the uh, cardiovascular mortality after invasive treatment. So the summarize of the phenotypes of aortic stenosis with reduced ejection fraction, we have many phenotypes. For example, the severe aortic stenosis in heart failure uh, with reduced ejection fraction and low flow, low gradient with low flow no flow low gradient. And simply the severe aortic stenosis and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and mean pressure gradient more than 40, this patient is good candidate uh, for the invasive treatment, both AVR and TAPR. But uh, for example, the severe aortic stenosis with heart failure uh, reduced ejection fraction, low flow, low gradient without flow reserved by dopamine stress echo, the rule out the shoot aortic stenosis by alternative imaging and uh, guideline is recommended likely benefit for AVR or TAVA based on registry data, class 2A indication ESG guideline. And most challenging field is a uh, moderate AES with heart failure re reduced ejection fraction. It means a should AES or simply moderate AES, but it is very challenging and very interesting ongoing randomized trial. Uh, the TABA unload trial is one-to-one -one randomization in patient with moderate AES, the patient with medical therapy plus TABA and uh, patient with only medical treatment. But these data are so limiting and wait for the results for such kind of very interesting pivotal randomized trial. Anyway, so we simplify this uh, presentation. If a patient diagnosis as a severe AS, severe AS with 
heart failure uh, reduced ejection fraction. Which one is better? Guideline directed medical therapy, TAVR, or SAVR? And uh, as everybody knows, uh, for example, the guideline or some recommendation, diuretics for heart failure or nitrates and beta blockers for angina. Uh, summary of the use for medical treatment of valvular disease shows. However, the diuretics may also reduce the cardiac output and worsening fatigue, and beta blocker and nitrates cause the symptomatic hypertension, especially in their use shortly after exertion. So, pharmacological therapy may be limited in the setting of severe AS with reduced ejection fraction. And the previous pivotal several landmark trials in patients with heart failure reduced ejection fraction excludes the hemodynamically significant aortic stenosis. We don't have enough data. And uh, uh, in contrast, the TAVA, or of course SAVA, is superior compared with guideline directed medical therapy, which includes the palliative therapy, balloon aortic valvuloplasty. The previous uh, partner trial shows the uh, superior or better outcome in TAVA patient compared with the standard therapy. It means a guideline directed medical therapy and including the balloon aortic valvoplasty. So we know the limitation of medical therapy for aortic stenosis patients and balloon aortic valvoplasty. I would show the case. Uh, 80 years old female patient, she complains of dyspnea and uh, the symptom is worsened, 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 and admitted to our hospital, the exacerbation of heart failure. And the chest x ray also shows a cardiomegaly and pulmonary edema and pleural infusion. Electrocardiogram shows a uh, 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 sinus lesion plus uh, APC and tachycardiac state, and the echocardiography shows a low ejection fraction, calculated uh, EF is 40%, but the mean pressure gradient is, is 90. It's so uh, severe, very severe state. So patient prognosis is diagnosis of acute heart failure with severe AES, and the NPPV and diuretics and the catecholamine were started after the mission, but the heart failure was uh, worsening. Now, after 10 hours from hospitalization, the patient complicated the worsening of heart failure and symptoms again, and leading to the cardiac arrest. The patient was transferred to the catelab, and ECMO, PCPS, and IABP were inserted Afterwards, coronary angiography was performed. Unfortunately, the coronary angiography showed the uh, three vessel disease in the right and left coronary artery. So we choose the uh, palliative therapy using the balloon aortic valvuloplasty and the mean pressure gradient, uh, gradient significantly decreased, but it's not enough, 90 from 90 to 50. And the uh, revascularization for the coronary artery disease is completely done. However, and, uh, after the valvuloplasty, the echocardiogram shows uh, still uh, severe stenosis, severe aortic stenosis. And uh, this patient prognosis is patients underwent PCI for three vessel disease and BAB for severe aortic stenosis. And the ejection fraction is improved from 40 to 53%. And the severe aortic stenosis is still severe, but it improved. Mean pressure gradient 90 to 67 were improved. On the first operative day, the patient was hemodynamically stable without ECMO and IABP. However, the patient level of consciousness was good and uh, uh, Tabi was scheduled after the contrast CT. On the second post-operative day, sudden hypertension and bradycardia developed, leading to PEA again. 
and cardiopulmonary resuscitation was um, pro, pro, um, less possible, and the patient did not wish to have VCPS inserted again. So this patient is died. In contrast, the TAVA or SAVA invasive therapy is useful in patients with AS and reduced uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. This is a 95 years old female, <laughs> it's very high age. And chest X-ray also showed the pulmonary edema and pulmonary effusion. And uh, electrocardiogram shows the tachycardiac state and uh, uh, saturation value is 87. And coronary angiography shows no significant stenosis. But uh, uh, transthoracic echocardiography showed the severe aortic stenosis and severe mitral regurgitation and left ventricular ejection fraction is 38% is 95% of patients, acute heart failure. So we should stop the invasive therapy. And the respiratory condition is deteriorated during the CAG. And she was intubated the mecha under the mechanical ventilation. Which treatment do you choose? And the lactate is significantly elevated, 10.9, and the ejection fraction is 38, and extremely small body. So we have no, no, no choice for this patient. Probably the palliative care or best supportive care is considered, but uh, uh, the, his, her family and we choose the TAVA, emergent TAVA for this patient. And this is a uh, contrast CT findings before the procedure. And aortic valve complex shows a uh, uh, relatively uh, large amount of the calcium on the aortic glute, but it's suitable for TAVA. And we did the TAVA via transfemoral with stiff wire and S3, choose the uh, sapien 3 valve but ECs did not cross. By changing the dry seal, S3 was able to pass through the dry seals without no resistance. It is a technical point. And finally, the Sapien 3 23 millimeter implantation was successfully deployed without any complications. And uh, uh, our stenosis is completely improved. This is a final angiogram. No aortic regurgitation, no severe stenosis. And surprisingly, the functional MR is completely disappeared after the TAVA procedure. <laughs> it's very interesting. And uh, this patient, so the TAVA treated severe aortic stenosis and severe mitral regurgitation. So, Generally recommended, we should not postpone the emergent procedure, emergent invasive procedure, delayed BAV or TAVI in emergent cases, worsens the prognosis by previous reports. And which is better, emergent TAVA or a palliative emergent BAV? So, of course, the uh, early mortality and late mortality is still high, but emergent TAVA or TAVI is uh, superior compared with the BAV treatment. So that is the reason why we choose uh, uh, TAVA compared with uh, medical or BAV therapy. So my, my final answer is this should making the best management of AES patients in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. I think the guideline medical therapy is fastly selected plus TAVA or SAVA. So next question is, which is better, uh, TAVA or SAVA? The previous uh, pivotal partner trial showed the equivalent or superior outcome in TAVA compared with SAVA treatment. But this sub analysis focused on the ejection fraction. We have no data concerning the reduced ejection fraction. The sub analysis only focused on the uh, cutoff range of the ejection fraction 55 
55 and 65. So we don't have enough data. The reduced ejection fraction, for example, less than 50, less than 40. And uh, this slide shows uh, uh, previous reports concerning the, uh, uh, the results of the reduced ejection fraction patient with AS. This is the SABA data. And we have not enough data concerning the TABA results. In summary, the mortality of AS with heart failure reduced ejection fraction. The SABA data shows the early 30 day mortality is reaching 5 to 15%. And late, it means, uh, for example, five years, the mortality is 25 to 50%. In contrast, the TABA shows the early results of mortality is approximately four to eight percent. It's comparable between the SABA and TABA. And rate of mortality, we don't have enough data, long-term outcomes of TABA. So data is still limiting in this field. And this is a, a current recommendation of ACCH ESC guideline. It still determined considering the traditional surgical score, for example, the STS score, and patients were divided in low, intermediate, high, and extreme risk. And decision making, which is beta, TABA, or SABA, is determined based on the surgical risk score. But, it, but I think what should we do as a next step? In the uh, risk stratification beyond the surgical risk score, we need. Probably we need a TABA specific risk model to evaluate and uh, ap appropriate candidate between TABA and SABA. For example, the limitation of the traditional surgical risk score, uh, patient categorized low risk score, STS less than 4%, 70 years old patient, for example, the liver disease or hematologic disease, this patient is truly the high surgical, uh, not, not a surgical risk. No, this is a very high surgical risk, but SS score is still less than 4%. And 80 to 90 years old patient without comorbidities, of course, this patient is a low surgical risk, but this patient is not a good candidate for SABR. I think this, this patient is a good candidate for TAVR. And the intermediate risk patients, the 60 to 80 years old, younger generation with a few communities, not a good candidate for TABA. We need a more, more, more long term data. Of course, we ASEAN cohort, the life expectancy is significantly longer compared with Western people. So I think the uh, limit, I think we should focus on the limitation of traditional surgical risk scoring. And this is the data from Ocean Tabi Registry in Japan. And uh, if we divided the uh, patient prognosis in based on the surgical risk score, low, intermediate, high, but the traditional surgical risk score is not useful for evaluating the risk stratification concerning the late mortality. Low and intermediate risk, there is no significant difference in the uh, mortality rates up to two years. So we should divide it only simply low and intermediate risk should be categorized under one category high or non-high risk patients. In addition, we need in the real world the true risk stratification for predicting. For example, I provoked the one-year mortality risk model after TABA. We need the information for gender, BMI, clinical frailty scale, atrial fibrillation, blah, blah, blah. We can calculate the uh, risk for evaluating the one-year mortality after TABA. And uh, uh, for example, such using a true risk model, the patient risk stratification is more useful. Anyway, so this is my concluded slides. The best management of AS in heart failure is reduced ejection fraction. Beyond the surgical risk score, we should consider the uh, risk benefit balance between the TABA and the SABA, and the best appropriate treatment should be determined. 
uh, plus the guideline directed medical therapy. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Yama um, Moto. That's really insightful and uh, good sharing that you had. Um, I have, um, let me start with maybe one question. As you know, um, patients with uh, in reduced EF tend to can have because of severe aortic stenosis, they can have concomitant coronary artery disease. So in this group of patients with concomitant coronary artery disease, the first question is, how do you determine which takes predominance of the symptoms and how would you then approach whether to do VAS first or to do aortic valve inspection? I'm sorry, I can't hear uh, clearly, please. Oh, sorry. So my yeah. question is, concomitant coronary artery disease in patients with severe aortic stenosis in patients with reduced EF is very, very common or prevalent. How do you know whether the symptoms is related to coronary artery disease oh. or severe aortic stenosis? And if so, how, which intervention would you go for? The revascularization approach first? Yeah, or, yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you. Very important point. I think the, uh, the improvement of ischemia is determined by the FFR, or the physiological findings, based on the physiological findings. It's not a clinical, uh, it, 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 is a, uh, it is very difficult to distinguish the symptom is truly uh, originated by AS or uh, C, uh, coronary artery disease, but the uh, improvement of the ischemia is determined by the FFR study. And if the FFR study is not so significant, I think the uh, uh, AS treatment is first. Thereafter, the coronary artery disease is treated. But if the uh, ischemic territory is very large and the significant FF value was proven, I think the coronary artery is first treated. Thereafter, the TAVI or a surgical AV valve is considered. But in surgical cases, uh, CABG plus uh, AV valve is uh, generally recommended. Thank you. Hey. Uh, yeah. may, may I join the discussion? Yes, please. I actually wanted to uh, invite you to. <laughs> I feel very interesting about your question. Yes. For patients with severe AS, low ejection fraction, always associated with coronary artery disease. Uh, you know, but we kind of surgeon, we want to very extensive operation to solve the, the LD valve disease that is AVR plus cabbage, uh, a complete revascularization might be the best way to save him, as you know. So always very long operation time. That means very long bypass time. That means uh, very long, very big myocardial edema after the operation. So with uh, difficult post-operative cause, many times with such mortalities, you know. Okay, that's the early years, about 10 years ago, the, the usual scenario for this poor case. And now we, in our hospital, we use uh, ECMO. Uh, our, our hospital has uh, relatively uh, many, many ECMO experience to, for post-operative uh, support. And uh, usually we, do still the same operation, complete operation once to save his life is our best hope. And uh, supported by ECMO roughly for five days or seven days after the operation, then the condition get a stable, stable. We remove the ECMO patient recover gradually from the operation. And if they can recover, they can improve. The critical period is about one week. That's my personal experience. That is a very, very interesting question. Thanks again. Yeah. Can I ask you further? Because I wanted to ask you, you, do you have any experience telling us which are the group, or actually these questions can go to both speakers, I mean, both uh, panelists here. Which 
patients would you approach it by a palliative approach, which means is there any parameters or clinical features that you will say you will not touch surgically so that the transcatheter team will then take over and help the patient? <laughs> I, I, I can answer it very quickly and briefly, you know, in, in the recent two years, our cardiology did a good help for us. Why? Because most of the time it was done in our hospital by our cardiologist. And uh, for this case, we provide the uh, ECMO support as a backup. They do the TAVI. That's a, really a teamwork, as you know. And uh, maybe they add a coronary standing, you know, and uh, post-operative if uh, we partially solve the critical condition of aortic stenosis and uh, everything gets stabilized, ECMO support, and uh, we can do things step by step. That means a stage operation for this poor patient. The bridge, we use ECMO as a bridge to get better results. The, that's, that's our personal experience to share with you guys. I would like to hear the opinion from Dr. Yamamoto and from Dr. Yo. Thank you. Dr. Yamamoto, you have any experience in the patients that you will say, you know, we're not going to treat you. And all those that you do not want to send for uh, in any interventions. I think he can't hear us right. Um, can you hear us, uh, Dr. Yamamoto? Yes, uh, okay, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I think we were discussing which are the group of patients that we will think a palliative approach will be a, a acceptable ones. What are those parameters that you will share with our uh, listeners that which are the ones that you know they're not going to do well? Oh, you should treat everyone. Yeah, so... In our country, economic issue is still a very big problem, to, to be honest with you guys. Yeah, maybe I can share. Actually, for us, the same. Um, you know, if we find a problem, and unless we are not going to change the prognosis or the clinical status of the patient, for example, if the patient is physically very mild and not able to have a quality of life, then we should really you know, be palliating the patients in medical therapy, even if you find a true severe aortic stenosis, because we know it's not going to change very much. But this is this is my personal stance because you know that if you do a perform a good TABA in such cases, you probably can prolong the survival of the patients for at least 12 months. But if 12 months is with patients who's not able to enjoy the quality of life, it's something that is probably debatable. Um, I think we have very good um, discussions on this very particular group of patients. Um, I think we should move on to our next speaker. Thank you very much again, uh, Dr. Uh, Yamamoto, for sharing your talks and experience. Let's move to the last speaker. I have the pleasure to invite Dr. Lau, who is a, a cardiologist from uh, Brunei, and she's going to share with us the timing of surgical intervention for severe aortic regurgitations. And Dr. Lau, please. Uh, yeah, hi. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prof. You. Nice to meet you again. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is uh, I'm Lau Bingo from Brunei Darussalam. Uh, my talk is on the timing of surgical intervention for severe aortic regurgitation uh, with rheumatic or non-rheumatic mechanism, any point of no return. Um, aortic regurgitation is uh, reported in up to about 15% of adults and after mitral regurgitation and aortic stenosis, it ranks third in the prevalence amongst valvular heart disease. And its prevalence increases with um, advancing age, ranging from about 5% in the population um, in those younger than 50 years of age to about 16% in those um, older than 70 years of age. And now a shift in the age distribution towards an elderly population will likely amplify the burden of aortic regurgitation to the healthcare um, in the future. 
Um, the older literature actually reported a very low mortality rate of 0.2% per year in asymptomatic patients, but recent data have suggested that this um, mortality rate is not that benign, it's up to about 2% per year in asymptomatic patients. On the other hand, symptomatic patients have high mortality rate. Now, the um, etiology of the LT regurgitation um, can, I mean, can be uh, related to either a leaflet and or LT root pathology that can be um, acquired or congenital in its origin. Um, LT regurgitation can be associated with a degree of althopathy in most um, instances. And so the assessment of the LT root and ascending aorta is integral um, in the assessment of LT regurgitation. Now, with the advent of um, aortic valve repair, um, understanding the mechanisms of aortic regurgitation is important. And broadly speaking, there are three types of aortic regurgitation, um, with type 1 and type 2 being more amenable to um, successful aortic valve repair. Um, most patients um, who, uh, most patients with indications um, for surgery in severe aortic regurgitation will require either a uh, mechanical valve or bioprosthetic valve. Um, however, um, valve repair is actually possible in a selected number of patients. And although the approach of uh, primary aortic valve repair is not yet generalizable and its durability is not known, um, excellent medium-term results have been reported when it was performed in high volume and highly specialized centers. And a meta-analysis has actually shown um, the in-hospital in one year um, mortality uh, rate was comparatively lower in the repair cohort as um, opposed to those patients with aortic valve replacement. And it has also been reported that the 10-year rate of uh, valve-related complication was considerably lower after having aortic valve repair. Um, and this is because of freedom from long-term anti um, anticoagulation, more physiological valve function, um, and lower risk of endocarditis. Now, I'm going to be talking about the timing of surgery for uh, significant aortic regurgitation. And traditionally, as we all know, this has been guided by the presence of symptoms left ventricular function and left ventricular dimension. Now, I'll also be uh, touching on some of the other parameters uh, that can be used in decision making um, in timing the surgery for significant aortic regurgitation. And these are left ventricular global longitudinal strain or LVGLS, brand natriuretic peptide or BMP and um, myocardial fibrosis and exercise TAPSI or tricuspid annular plan systolic excursion, which is a marker of right ventricular function. Um, in the management of aortic regurgitation, um, the 2017 ESC and EACTS guidelines, um, they consider the, um, the diameter of the ascending aorta first. They recommend surgery when the diameter of the aorta is uh, between 4.5 to, to, uh, 4 .5 to 5.5 centimeters. And um, uh, depending on the uh, etiology of the um, aortic dilatation, uh, regardless of the severity of the um, aortic regurgitation. Next, uh, when it comes to significant aortic regurgitation, the timing of surgery is uh, guided by one, the presence of symptoms, and two, by uh, left ventricular dysfunction. And these are class one indication for surgery. However, on the other hand, um, in patient having uh, asymptomatic severe aortic regurgitation, um, the timing of surgery will be guided by um, left ventricular dimension. And this is defined by left ventricular and systolic dimension that is greater than five centimeter or an indexed left ventricular and systolic dimension that is greater than 2.5 centimeter per meter square, or a left ventricular and diastolic dimension that is greater than 7 centimeter. The latest American guidelines are more or less consistent. However, I just want to highlight a few points. They have now redefined the um, left ventricular dysfunction cutoff value as uh, to less than 55%. And in American guidelines, uh, having a left ventricular and diastolic dimension of uh, 6.5 centimeters is a class 2B indication for surgery. Um, and one unanswered question is the timing of surgery for rheumatic aortic regurgitation. And most of the recommendations for surgical management of um, severe aortic regurgitation uh, for rheumatic uh, aortic regurgitation have been extrapolated from data on non rheumatic aortic regurgitation. Now, um, the timing of surgery for severe aortic regurgitation, well, for, sorry, the timing of surgery for severe aortic regurgitation is clear for patients having symptoms and left ventricular dysfunction, and these are class one indications. However, on the other hand, the timing of surgery is uh, actually controversial for patients having asymptomatic severe aortic regurgitation and preserved left ventricular function, where traditionally left ventricular dimensions have been used to guide the timing of surgery. And um, there is actually evidence out there to suggest that um, 
when um, the when current guidelines, surgical threshold setting that is symptoms and left ventricular dysfunction, there is already irreversible myocardial damage that can persist after um, surgery and that the post-operative outcomes are actually worse for these patients. So in this study conducted by Mantius, um, um, in patients having significant uh, severe aortic regurgitation with preserved left ventricular function, having no or minimal symptoms, they found that um, patients having aortic valve surgery had better long-term survival um, with a life expect expectancy that is comparable to that of a normal matched US population. And these authors also found in the non-surgical group that the risk of death significantly and continuously increased when the index left ventricular and systolic dimension was greater than two centimeter per meter square, a threshold that is lower than the current recommended value of greater than 2.5 centimeter per meter square. And um, these authors also reported that symptomatic patients actually had a twofold increased risk of mortality as compared to asymptomatic patients. Now, the findings of um, Mantius were actually corroborated, corroborate, uh, corroborated by um, the a study conducted by the minister, uh, who showed that the adjusted 10-year survival for those uh, patients undergoing aortic valve surgery for severe aortic regurgitation, the adjusted 10-year survival, survival was better among patients without operative triggers or with class 2 triggers um, than when compared to patients having class 1 triggers. And these authors also found that freedom from hospitalization for heart failure was actually better in those patients who were operated before the onset of class one triggers. And uh, similarly, these authors also found that mortality um, increased when the, um, when the index left ventricular and systolic dimension was greater than two centimeter per meter square. And in this landmark study conducted by Young in Mayo Clinic where they were able to compare um, both surgical and non-surgical patients, there were a higher number of deaths in the non-surgical group. And uh, these authors uh, found, again, that the index left ventricular and systolic dimension was inversely proportional to all-cause mortality in both the operator and the non-surgical group. And here, having an index uh, uh, left ventricular and systolic dimension of greater than 2.5 centimeter per meter square uh, was actually, um, actually conferred a uh, increased uh, risk for all-cause mortality. And in ventricular and systolic dimension of greater than 2.5 centimeter per meter square, and having left ventricular dysfunction uh, was associated with increased risk of mortality. Now, so it seems that a lower left uh, index left ventricular and systolic dimension um, that is greater than 2 centimeter per meter square appeared to be indicated for earlier timing of um, uh, valve surgery for severe aortic reg uh, regurgitation rather than the one that is recommended in the current guideline, which is set at greater than 2.5 centimeter per meter square. Now, moving on, I'm just going to be touching on um, GLS, which is global longitudinal strain, and talking about left ventricular global longitudinal strain. Uh, this is actually a marker of subclinical myocardial dysfunction, and it can actually detect subendocardial uh, myocardial fibrosis uh, before deterioration of left ventricular function. And these authors actually looked at patients having severe aortic regurgitation with preserved left ventricular function, and found that the LVGLS was actually worse in, than the uh, uh, defined threshold of uh, minus 19%. So this paper, um, they actually looked at a, uh, they lo actually looked at a thousand uh, patients having asymptomatic severe aortic regurgitation, having preserved left ventricular function and an index left ventricular and systolic dimension of less than 2.5 centimeter per meter square. And they found that the uh, unoperated patients having worsening of um, LVGLS of worse than minus 19% um, had actually high mortality. And um, uh, these same authors also looked at um, the value of baseline and follow-up GLS in patients having aortic valve surgery uh, for asymptomatic severe aortic regurgitation and preserved left ventricular function. And they found that the baseline LVGLS um, was uh, first than 19% was associated with reduced survival. That is, it can actually pronosticate. And in those uh, group of patients who underwent uh, surgery, who returned for post-operative follow-up, they also found that persistently impaired LVGLS was associated with increased mortality. And this uh, authors also concluded that um, an LVGLS, um, um, uh, a drop of LVGLS of 5% from baseline to follow-up was associated with reduced survival. Now, moving on, I'm just going to be um, touching on this um, uh, mixed aortic valvular disease and the use of LVGLS in predicting um, um, as a risk predictor 
Uh, as we all know, aortic regurgitation can be associated with a degree of aortic stenosis. And this paper is interesting in that it looked at whether LVGLS can be used to restratify um, patients having mixed aortic valvular disease. And again, this paper actually showed that um, LVGLS was an important predictor of mortality with a value that is uh, worse than minus 15% conferring um, a higher risk of mortality in these patients. Now, um, there was this paper um, discussing the uh, role of TAPSI um, in predicting the need for aortic valve surgery. So this paper actually looked at the role of ta exercise TAPSI in decision making for asymptomatic severe aortic regurgitation uh, patients having preserved left ventricular function. And they found that exercise TAPSI uh, was uh, significantly reduced in patients having severe aortic regurgitation. So essentially what this paper sort of um, went on to say was that uh, exercise TAPSI or tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion, which is a, a marker of right ventricular function. Essentially what it says is that exercise TAPSI was an independent predictor of the need for aortic valve surgery and, and suggested that exercise TAPSI may be used in, um, in decision-making to um, decide whether a patient um, uh, goes for earlier surgery for severe aortic regurgitation. Uh, now, um, B-type natriuretic peptide and N-terminal um, uh, pro-B-type uh, pro natriuretic peptide, these are neural hormones that actually, uh, they, they result from the breakdown of uh, pro-BNP, and they're actually neural hormones that are primarily released from the ventricular myocardium in response to increased myocardial wall stress that can be seen in um, chronic aortic regurgitation. And what this paper found was that the BNP uh, can actually predict the risk of disease progression uh, for patients having severe um, aortic regurgitation at the subclinical level. And they also found that persistent BNP elevations uh, during serial uh, follow-ups, um, persistent BNP elevations were associated with worse outcome of LV, uh, left ventricular dysfunction, heart failure symptoms and death after a duration of about 15 months. Um, Prof, you touch on, uh, on uh, CMR in assessing um, aortic regurgitation severity. So um, there's this paper um, that looked at the role of um, um, uh, cardiac MRI to reclassify the severity of aortic regurgitation severity. Now, uh, CMR um, can be used to quantify aortic regurgitation severity in cases where the echo examination is suboptimal or when the clinical findings do not correlate with the echo findings. And this is actually recommended in the present guideline. So in this paper, um, with uh, 40 patients having um, moderate to severe aortic regurgitation on echo, um, they were found, nearly 50% of them were found to have severe aortic regurgitation on MRI by the presence of hollow diastolic retrograde flow seen in the descending aorta. So essentially, um, and, and the, on the other hand, 34% um, of patients having severe aortic regurgitation on echo, they were found to have non-severe aortic regurgitation when MRI was done. So essentially, um, cardiac MRI can reclassify the severity of aortic regurgitation. Um, it is fast and feasible and easy to do. Um, however, um, it's not available in all centers and um, CMR can actually complement echocardiographic AR assessment in cases where the echo examination is suboptimal or when difficult clinical decisions need to be taken. And um, on the other hand, the presence of hollow diastolic retrograde flow seen in the ascending aorta, sorry, in the descending aorta, was shown to be associated with an increased risk of adverse outcome um, in patients having severe aortic regurgitation. Uh, now moving on, I'm just going to be touching on. Um, this uh, uh, T1 mapping technique to diagnose diffuse interstitial fibrosis. Now, um, chronic aortic regurgitation leads to uh, left ventricular remodeling, which is associated with two forms of myocardial fibrosis, regional replacement fibrosis and diffuse interstitial fibrosis. So the presence of uh, fibrosis actually um, uh, the, uh, indicate um, disease progression at the subclinical level. And as we all know, regional replacement fibrosis can be conventionally diagnosed by the use of lead gadolinium enhancement on MRI, um, whereas this uh, so-called diffuse interstitial fibrosis or reactive fibrosis can only be picked up by these so-called T1 mapping techniques. Um, and this paper, which was uh, recently published in JAG uh, Imaging, it looked at the role of diffuse interstitial fibrosis uh, using T1 mapping in patients having severe aortic regurgitation. And um, from, the, uh, uh, from doing uh, pre-contrast T1 and post-contrast T2 uh, T1 images, they were able to derive this so-called indexed extracellular volume. And what they found was this indexed extracellular volume or index ECB 
uh, correlated with the uh, severity of aortic regurgitation. In other words, index extracellular uh, volume uh, significantly increased uh, with the degree of uh, severity of aortic regurgitation. So the index uh, ECV or index um, extracellular volume actually measures the absolute volume of left ventricular myocardium that is in the extracellular space divided by the body surface area. And what it actually measures uh, is, is, um, is that it actually measures the total left ventricular interstitial fibrosis burden. And in this paper, they found that index extracellular volume of greater than 24 mils per meter square and an aortic regurgitation, regurgitant fraction of greater than 30% as detected on MRI was associated with the highest event point of a composite endpoint of death and aortic valve replacement. So essentially, this paper went on to say that um, the index, uh, sorry, the index in extracellular volume uh, can predict the need for um, aortic valve surgery. Now, moving on, um, the surgical mortality has been uh, reported to be low uh, recently. I mean, over the last 30 years, the surgical mortality rate has reduced significantly uh, such that it is now lower than 1%. And this, this is due to um, um, advanced surgical techniques, include, including uh, aortic valve repair and minimally invasive aortic uh, valve surgery, and also due to improved uh, intra-operative um, myocardial protection and improved post-operative care. So now that surgical mortality is low um, and that uh, aortic valve repair is possible, and with the uh, valuable evidence to suggest that uh, one intervenes earlier uh, for severe aortic regurgitation. So uh, intervening earlier in the course of severe aortic regurgitation appeared to be beneficial. However, uh, shared decision-making and discussions between the risk of early surgery um, versus the risk of delaying surgery, and also discussion um, in, in between the trade-offs between um, aortic valve replacement and aortic valve repair is essential. So in um, the assessment of aortic regurgitation to determine whether aortic valve is uh, surgery is required for patient, uh, firstly, one needs to assess the severity of aortic regurgitation. And, and traditionally, this can be done on echo um, and can be complemented by CMR when echo examination is suboptimal or when clinical data is equivocal or when the uh, clinical findings do not correlate with the um, left ventricular function. Now, left ventricular GLS, as mentioned, is a marker of subclinical myocardial dysfunction. And it can be used also in decision making for uh, the timing of surgery for aortic regurgitation. Um, a value that is worse than minus 19% uh, has been shown to be associated with uh, reduced survival. And thirdly, one needs to assess the uh, left ventricular um, dimension in systole. So the current surgical threshold is set at greater than 2.5 centimeters per meter square. However, uh, data is, is emerging that. Um, a threshold value of greater than two centimeter per meter square is associated with the increased risk of mortality. And uh, fourthly is to assess for the uh, presence of aerothopathy, uh, which is commonly associated with aortic regurgitation. And uh, this can actually guide the timing and the type of surgery to be used. And next comes uh, MRI and BMP. Um, and this can be used in the clinical follow-up of patients, uh, MRI to assess for the presence of myocardial fibrosis, and then also to reclassify aortic regurgitation severity in cases uh, where it wasn't clear on echo, uh, and BNP also to, uh, to help detect from uh, the, the risk of disease progression at the subclinical stage. So to conclude, um, there's data out there to suggest that um, there's possible long-term survival benefit from the earlier timing of aortic valve surgery for patients having asymptomatic severe aortic regurgitation and having an index left ventricular systolic dimension of greater than two centimeter per meter square. Um, just to highlight that these are all observational data and so they haven't been included in the present guidelines. Well, cardiofibrosis detection by CMR is, uh, can be used or potentially to risk stratify patients having severe aortic regurgitation and perhaps can justify earlier surgical intervention before extensive fibrosis and irreversible myocardial uh, damage develops. And then BMP and anti-pro-BMP levels can also, to be, uh, can also be used to follow up patients, essentially to identify patients at high risk of um, clinical progression. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. B. I think that was really comprehensive. And we now know um, how to and when to use um, um, uh, all these markers. Can mm -hmm. I ask a very simple question? Yeah. 
I'm a clinician who looks after patients with chronic aortic regurgitation. The patient is asymptomatic, but I know that on echo, the LV is dilating. What should you follow up test with and what will be the test and what are you looking out for? Um, sorry, Prof, you, I missed the last part of your question. The LV is what, sorry? The, the LV is dilating, but it hasn't hit the target um, guidelines recommended therapy and the patient claims to be asymptomatic. What tests are you going to do order and what are you going to tell me? Oh, okay. So essentially what we can use to monitor this patient is um, one of the other thing that I actually mentioned, uh, didn't mention in the talk is uh, to use exercise echo. I actually didn't mention in my talk, but I suppose exercise echo can be used to uh, restratify these patients to look for, to elicit for symptoms um, and also to look for uh, contractile reserve. I suppose if a um, patient is... Um, if a stress echo is able to elicit symptoms, it sort of suggests that this patient has latent um, elbow dysfunction. And on the other hand, we can also use BNP to monitor, to monitor this patient. If the BNP level is, um, or the BNP or the anti pro BNP levels are raised, I suppose, um, you know, um, at the end, we can use all these uh, markers to uh, help us in decision making for timing of surgery for, for, for this patient. Thank you. I think that's really um, uh, uh, comprehensive. I mean, I think the important thing is what are the most sensitive markers or parameters we can trust for detections of LV systolic uh, dysfunctions in a patient with, uh, with, who is asymptomatic. And, and the truth is that there are many, many markers that we can detect, and a lot of the data are really on retrospective database. So in prospective data database, when you have a core lab adjudication kind of uh, uh, parameters, it may be something that's helpful. I use clinically in the lab also on um, GRS, but I find that can be variability between uh, uh, studies to studies. So an independent way of uh, looking at the GRS may be helpful. I think CMR is great, but CMR in my mind is very expensive and you can't do it on a yearly basis for someone who is totally asymptomatic. So I like your idea of actually looking at the clinical status and, and following up with the patient that say, look, you know, if there's any depressed in your effort tolerance, perhaps we can have a closer monitoring, something that you can trust. And in, in our lab, most of the time, we actually look at the LP uh, uh, and DAS uh, diameter because that is quite reproducible. And when there is a little bit of in, inconsistency, then you go on and do a CMR. I like as well the ProBNP because ProBNP is the biochemical uh, way of uh, suggesting that the LV has shown sign of decompensations and I do monitor them. So in conclusion, for me, I probably will just look at a patient in clinical status and number two, biomarkers, which is really cheap. And third is just looking at the LV function with GRS. Dr. Yu, or Professor hey. Yu, from surgeon <laughs> perspective, yeah. What, what do you yeah. think is important in this group? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, first, I have to thank Dr. Lau to teach to to tell me the the LVGIS. I don't have uh, many experience in that. Uh, regarding the severe L, L regarding the LT regurgitation with severe LV dilatation, sometimes we have to deal deal with this patient, as you know they can recover from the operation frequently, you know? You do the LT AR case with LVE, DD, for example, 65 millimeter. The immediate post-operative is uh, satisfactory, but they all not, not always frequently come back one or two years because of end-stage heart failure needing BAD or heart transplant. So in my clinic works, I will do MRI for this case, trying to use uh, T1 mapping, as you just tell me, to find the uh, interstitial fibrosis. Because I believe uh, LV dilatation will induce some microscopic change of uh, microsports interstitial fibrosis that will make uh, things irreversible, you know? But uh, as uh, Dr. Dr. Yo tell, 
you know, it's relatively expensive and uh, many patients can't stand the procedure. You know, you have to, to lie down for 30 minutes uh, for a complete MRI study. So I feel very nice to hear you that uh, LV longitudinal strain might be contribute to differentiate the, the, which one is reversible and which one is irre irreversible. I think it's nice. I will study it in my clinical works. Very thanks for your, your great speech. I learned it very much. Great. Yeah, I think um, it, I wonder whether there are other questions uh, from the um, panel. Um, otherwise, um, I think that was truly uh, four, uh, you know, four wonderful talks that really educate us on the aortic valve, uh, uh, valvular diseases, both from aortic stenosis to aortic regurgitation, when to intervene, and in patients with you know difficult decision making with impaired LV function. Um, I have enjoyed today's talk and uh, the speakers are great and it was um, wonderful listening to them. Um, and my chairman, Professor Yu, was excellent. He asked very important questions. Not only that, he's very experienced. He shared with us his uh, personal um, surgical experience. And I think that really adds weight to our uh, webinar. Thanks, La Dr. Yu, oh, for, hey, for your welcome comments. And again, I have to thank all the speakers as well as all the audience to join us for this very comprehensive, educative, informative, uh, very nicely committee. Oh, thanks again for APSC committee to, 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 to have this meeting for us. Great. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Okay. Yeah. Hey, thank you.